His curiosity motivated him. He was just a, a very curious person. He wanted to help people. It was his dream to stop stroke. He found that ultrasound was a very important tool to listen to what was going on in the brain and the heart and the arteries. Merrill was, was really never looking back at what he accomplished, was always looking for the next important conversation, the next important subject, the next important piece of, of research that we could do. His gray cells never stopped working. And he had incredibly clear, sparkling blue eyes. He didn't create technology for the sake of technology. He created technology for the sake of bettering mankind and patient care. He lived with uh, his brothers and sisters and parents on the Indian Reservation in Oklahoma. They were the only uh, Caucasians within 300 miles. They would play cowboys and Indians together and uh, of course Merrill's family were the cowboys and the Indians were the Indians and I guess there were a few bloody noses but no deaths that were reported. Merrill was always a curious person. He set up a chemistry set in his garage and he was a typical budding scientist. Merrill uh, utilized the GI Bill to get his education in college. You know, he was always interested in cardiovascular work. Merrill was uh, an interesting mix of scientist and physician. His real interest was in physiology and moving systems in the body. Interestingly enough, he was also the band leader of his high school band, and he played the trumpet and accidentally blew a hole in his windpipe so he couldn't play the trumpet anymore, but I think the, the musical influence benefited him when he started listening to ultrasound and the frequencies, uh, the blood flow running through the blood. He recognized that was a normal blood flow and was abnormal blood flow because the blood was running faster through the system. It was, when you have a narrowing, the blood runs faster through the blood vessels. And I think his musical background helped him actually in his medicine. He was a professor of physiology at Bowman Gray Medical School in North Carolina. And he was experimenting as he was teaching and he invented the square wave electromagnetic flow meter. They initially used it on animals. They were trying to see what the blood flow was like in the coronary arteries. When we were first dating, he would always write something on napkins that he was thinking of some sort of an invention or uh, something about medicine. and. He was explaining it to me, and I was trying to understand. We were planning to go to San Diego on our honeymoon. So four days before we were going to be married, he called and said, Honey, how would you like to go to Acapulco instead? I said, Oh, that's, that's exciting. That's wonderful. I would love to go to Acapulco. And then I found out it was because he wanted to go by Galveston, Texas to a medical meeting on the way back. After Merrill was finished at Bowman Gray Medical School, he got an offer to go to the San Diego Zoo and do some experimentation on the animals there. The giraffe must regulate the blood flow to the brain under extreme postural changes. The giraffe may change his head level by as much as 20 feet in a matter of seconds. If the human brain was subjected to the same treatment, perhaps the blood vessels would rupture with the head down and the person would faint with the head up. The goal of this research is to learn how a giraffe is able to live many years of life without any apparent ill effects of high blood pressure or extreme postural change. We did EKGs on 
camels and ostriches and zebras. They were doing EKG on an ostrich, and they had him in this little trailer. And the strip recorder paper was going out the window um, as the data was coming off the neck of the ostrich. And they had trouble calming the ostrich. He was kicking and so on. So they struggled. They finally got the data and they were finished. They went around to the outside of the trailer to get the strip of quarter paper and it was being eaten by a camel on the other side as it was coming out the window. So their data <laughs> was for naught. <laughs> they actually offered him the job of being the medical director of the San Diego Zoo and Merrill thought long and hard about it and he determined that he was probably having so much fun at the zoo that if he got involved there, he might never make it back and be a, a human doctor rather than, a, than an animal doctor. So he finally decided to accept an offer to come to Seattle and be the head of the Virginia Mason Research Center, uh, which is now the Benaroya Institute. Merrill set up the hyperbaric lab at Virginia Mason. And I think that's where he really started being involved with Doppler ultrasound. They were looking at ways to measure and observe nitrogen bubbles in divers, which is the cause of the, the bends. Merrill became associated through the hyperbaric laboratory with John Lindbergh, who was a deep sea diver. And John was known for taking difficult dives when nobody else would do them, which is interesting because it's the opposite of his father who was up in the air doing impossible things. Well, John was doing the impossible things underneath the water. One day, John Lindbergh walked into the hyperbaric lab and he said, my, my father wants to come visit. Is, is that okay? And Merrill said, okay, well, when is he coming? He said, well, in about an hour. <laughs> Merrill was a Charles Lindbergh fan, and he was also a stamp collector. And so he immediately ran home and got a set of Charles Lindbergh stamps that he had recently bought. And he brought them back, intending to have Charles Lindbergh sign them, which would really increase the value of, of the stamps. And Merrill came back, and he and Charles Lindbergh got to talking technology and Doppler and everything. And Charles was a techie too, and so they got going, and Merrill forgot to, forgot to have him sign the stamps. And so he went, oh no. So he asked John, would you take these to your dad and have him sign them? Well, John said, sure. So he brought them back the next day, and Charles Lindbergh had signed the stamps, but he didn't really want to ruin the stamps, so he signed on the, in the margin on the card that they were on. So, and Merrill went, oh no. But, uh, and he also got a signed copy of uh, Charles Lindbergh's book, which was, which was nice. Merrill was interested in whale physiology, seal physiology, how they breathed, how they held their breath and would dive for long periods of time. And there was a diving connection there. He was interested in human diving and thought that he could learn something about an the way animals dove and the way their systems work. So he was approached to be the medical director for the NAMU expedition. Ted Griffin had this killer whale that he brought back from Canada that was captured in some fishing nets and he brought it all the way down and so we got started helping Ted care for the whale but when the whale got here, NAMU would not eat anything. So we were very worried about him. So Ted asked me one day, what can you do to enhance it? You know, can you make, help us with that? I said, well, I do remember when I was uh, in my internship, there was a popular treatment for people to inject vitamin B1 intravenously to improve the appetite. We don't do that anymore, but I don't know whether it worked or not, but I did remember that. And I said, well, let's go down to the veterinary supply and get some vitamin B1 and we put it in a syringe at the kind of dart that do for tranquilizer darts and we'll shoot this with a bow and arrow into the back of the whale and give him a shot of vitamin B1. So we retrieved the dart and it didn't hurt the whale, it didn't show any signs of doing anything. But about a week later, the animal started eating salmon until it was going out of style. 
by the truckload. I mean by the pickup truckload. He'd come and fork the salmon into the water and, the, and Namu was eating like crazy. The point of this story, if there is one, is that the good doctor always does something before the patient gets well on his own. <laughs> I think a lot of people saw him as this uh, efficient uh, inventor and clinician and so on, but he had a very warm side and I admired the fact that if he was very touched, it would bring tears to his eyes. He could actually cry, and, and I thought that was wonderful. The first little grandchild um, he would crawl around on the floor with because he was tall, and she would look up at him and fall over. So he got down on all fours and crawled around with her and, and read to her on the floor. and. I had a 60th surprise birthday party for him, and it was his custom to get down on the floor when our granddaughter was about three. She would knock on the door, and he would get down on his knees and open the door for her so he would be more on her level. So he saw me making preparations for his birthday party. It was on a Saturday and said, oh, what's going on? So I said, well, we're having a little family birthday party. So at the prescribed hour, about 6 o'clock, there was a little tiny knock at the door. He got down on his knees, opened the door, and there were two couples standing there that I had invited to the party. <laughs> and I don't know who was more surprised, him looking up at them from his knees or them looking down at him. <laughs> I remember when I first met Merrill, it was, it was in the same time frame that I saw the movie Titanic. <laughs> and I remember that the beginning of the movie Titanic, there was, they, they basically had the, the old woman laying there. And then, they, then the camera zoom, 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 zoom into her blue eyes. And then she was the young woman, the star, uh, Kate Winslet. And the inquisitiveness, the fascination with discussion, with, with all the elements of life, that's what struck me about Merrill, was that here is this elderly gentleman who I felt like I was with a kid. That would be the story of Merrill's life. I've been fortunate to be surrounded by a lot of smart people and um, the one genuine, genuine element of a smart person is that when you're with them you never feel that they're really smart. <laughs> His gray cells never stopped working. I'm, I'm wondering what he did at night. Many nights we were up in the night I would hear him pacing around or going to his computer and he would begin talking to me and we would talk way into wee hours because something bothered him about something he was inventing or business relationships or something. So he really did talk things over with me a great deal. Transcranial Doppler was kind of an offshoot. Dr. Spencer was always in, in, interested in cerebral circulation. He ran vascular labs that monitored blood flow all over the body from head to toe. When transcranial Doppler came along, the idea of it, and he started working with Rooney Oslett, who was the inventor of it, that really complemented the carotid examination. So now we're looking not just here, but we're looking at, at what the effect this has on blood flow in the brain. Transcranial Doppler uses an ultrasound probe, which uh, looks like a black cylinder. It's got a vibrating face in front that uh, operates at a very high frequency compared to what we can hear. And what we've got here is the desire to look at uh, vessels inside the brain and that's uh, shown in this anatomical model. You can see the face here and then uh, if I rotate up and so you can look inside the skull, there's all these blood vessels that are basically sitting on the floor of the skull and at the base of the brain. And what we're going to do on uh, my brain is look at this flow through the temporal bone, which is on the side of the head here. And this is really what uh, Merrill Spencer did pioneering work in, was observing this flow 
and characterizing uh, the hemodynamics, as it's called, and the particles that may be there as foreign objects uh, floating in the circulation, and these were called emboli or microemboli. So now we can see that blood in my brain at about 45 millimeters depth from the probe is flowing in an artery, and this artery is about three millimeters wide, and the maximum velocity of that flow is around 80 centimeters per second. That bright streak, this is a embolus that's probably a small bubble that has formed on my prosthetic heart valve and then jumped off because of the blood motion around it and it scatters to different parts of the body. This particular one went to my brain and you can see it show up in the middle cerebral artery here and then over a brief period of time it makes its way further out towards the probe or towards the side of the head. We discovered the microemboli come from these plaques and go to the brain and cause stroke. Uh, we also discovered that you know the significant stenosis reduces blood flow and that there's a lot of different um, anomalies in the brain that affect this. So transcranial Doppler was a non-invasive way of looking at it. That was really the, the, the birth of vascular ultrasound. That's where it all started. I mean, the, the multi-billion you know, billion dollar industry that exists today really had its beginnings in using ultrasound to look at carotid arteries. Patients who have a patent foramen ovale, which is a hole in the heart left over from birth, uh, and about a fifth of the patients in, in the population will have that, that's unknown to them until something happens, potentially a stroke, or today we're finding out that even migraine headache may be related to this hole. Well, Merrill had already developed a way of screening for that uh, with his transcranial Doppler uh, by injecting just agitated salt water into the vein and seeing if it showed up in the brain. It shouldn't. It should show up only in the lungs. But because of the communication in the hole in the heart, it shows up in the brain. It's, it's inert to the brain. It's not harmful but it gives an immediate uh, feedback to the physician and to the patient as to whether that PFO, that patent frame of valley, is present and whether Three, treatment is going to be effective. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Release, relax, and try not to move. My belief is that the adoption of that diagnostic tool to evaluate patients with PFO, both for stroke and, and increasingly for migraine, will probably have the longest effect and, and legacy from Merrill's work. Our crossroads really met when we started to close these holes in the heart, uh, these patent foraminal valleys. We will report to Dr. Reisman. Your results was were positive. Was it a significant amount? Or? Yeah, it looks like it'd be significant. What were his symptoms? It was through his observations and his ability to monitor these openings, these right to left shunts, but it was really the environment that he created, the culture he created, the adjudication of the data that he created that ultimately provided me, frankly, with the opportunity to succeed or to uh, exceed even my expectations in the area and then ultimately to translate that to other cardiologists. His primary focus throughout his life, I think, was teaching and investigating. We were very fortunate because he was invited all around the world and he uh, said I was like his American Express card. He wouldn't leave home without me. So, <laughs> so I went with him and we met many wonderful friends all over the world. In Dusseldorf, uh, my husband was awarded with a plaque. He said to me, I feel like king for a day. But when they brought him up to the stage and presented him with the plaque, he was always so, so wonderful to give me credit as his wife for my encouragement of his career. So they called him up to the stage, presented him with the plaque, and they had me sitting in the front row. And so he turned around and he said, and I would like to thank my wife. And he went like this for me to stand up and the whole group of about over 200 people stood up and, and clapped and he, he was so embarrassed because he was afraid that they were, he, that he was motioning to everyone to stand up. Merrill always said, 
I want to work as long as I have my marbles. And he never lost his marbles. And I think people would look at this elderly gentleman and, and say, yes, people are usually retired for 20 years uh, at this age. But he walked the walk and he talked the talk and he, he made sense. And he was, he was very intelligent all the way up until the very end of his life. We were having such uh, great experiences and enjoying our, our lives together so much that he said, well, I'm not ready to go. He said, when we go, we'll go kicking and screaming. He said, but with your bad joints, he said, I'll do the kicking, you do the screaming. <laughs> he said he had a strange feeling in his stomach and I said, oh, please go to the doctor. Oh, I will. And somehow he just didn't find time to go to the doctor and this went on for about six months. Finally, I said, when is your appointment? And he would say, well, I haven't made it yet, but perhaps next week I'll have time. I remember I was sitting in his office, and we were talking about a research project when he was interrupted by a phone call. And it was a phone call from his physician who was informing him that after his surgery to remove the pancreatic cancer, that a CT that they had done because of some non-healing scar had revealed that he had multiple spots of cancer throughout his body. And I listened to the conversation and even though I could only hear one side of it, I understood exactly what was being said and I, I kind of sat there and wasn't sure what to say or if to say anything or if to excuse myself. Um, but Merrill hung up the phone and kind of turned over to me and said, well, that wasn't that great of news. And uh, continued to talk about the research project. He knew that life's come to an end. That's the only certainty in life, you know, after you've been born, that you will be gone someday. But that he had to give up his work. Even uh, within the last month, he worked as, as many as eight nine hours a day. He would have a seven o'clock meeting in the morning and maybe get home at six o'clock at night. That was not unusual. He was so brave. He didn't complain. He knew what the end was going to be, but he never talked about it except he he did say to me about a week and a half before he passed away, honey, let's, let's buy a plot out at Acacia Cemetery because it's near our daughter Jill's espresso stand and it will be easy for people to come visit. And that's about as serious as he became about it. Even the day before he passed away, he was trying to get out of bed because he had to get to the lab, he thought. So I would just hug him and calm him down and say, everything is taken care of. You don't have to worry. Um, the labs are fine. And uh, then he would lie back down. But with his last breath, he was still trying to get to work. I uh, kissed him and told him I loved him, and he said, I'm a lucky man, just the day before he died. You know, Merrill just told me he'd had a wonderful life. And, um, and he was happy with it. I think we're at the beginning of the benefit of what Merrill Spencer brought to the world. I believe that he planted seeds that are, that are now growing into oak trees around the world in, in his field. So many people have written to me from around the world and said, he was my inspiration. His impact has been tremendous in developing technologies 
pushing me in such a way that they could be applied, first of all. Secondly, he was able to create a network in all those areas around the world. So not only introducing the technologies that he developed on his own or in conjunction, but he also set up the network that people could use it. He, he taught them. He didn't create technology for the sake of technology. He created technology for the sake of bettering mankind and patient care. His curiosity motivated him. He was just a, a very curious person. He wanted to help people. 